and the fact that 80% of the stars in our galaxy have been discovered to be binary star systems. And if you can see the image on the right of your screen, or the left if it reverses, I'm not sure if it will, um, but they make the figure eight. They do a dance. Robert S. Harrington, the chief astronomer for the U.S. Naval Observatory, published his paper, The Location of Planet X, in the Astronomical Journal. In an August 30, 1990 television interview with Zachariah Sitchin, Harrington also said that Pluto had been a satellite of Neptune, but it was dislodged by Planet X, which he believed could possibly sustain some form of life. He also showed Sitchin a diagram he had created approximating the location of Planet X. Following that interview, Harrington commissioned the construction of a special telescope for a Planet X photographic sky survey in 1991, which was completed at the Black Birch Observatory in New Zealand. The New Zealand observations were performed using Harrington's calculations, and the results were sent to NASA. However, those films vanished and have never been seen again, which leaves us with a big question. Did Harrington actually find Planet X, Neptune's perturber? of modern day astronomy is comets. Comets make no sense for this reason. They come from all over the place. In a linear universe, when you know the great ball of, of a primordial cloud of dust and gas swirling around flattens out into a pancake to make the solar system, that's the ecliptic. Everything formed in the ecliptic should be in the ecliptic. Nothing should be out of the ecliptic, and yet comets come from all over the place. So they had to be removed out to where they are some kind of way, but we don't have any idea. So they come up with this fantastic thing called the Oort cloud, which is so far away you can't imagine. It, it, the Oort cloud is one of the biggest jokes out there, and that's how they explain comets, because they can't explain them any other way. But the problem with comets is they have water in them. And anything out in space is not going to produce water. You produce water by being a cooling planet with lava spewing up the steam and stuff like that, and it condenses, etc. So comets have to begin in a planet. Welcome. Um, yes, my name's Ian Wright, and um, I'm going to tell you something about these things. These, uh, these are comets. Um, and you've already heard that the theme of this evening is, uh, is about life. And uh, what I want to do is explain to you my interest in what we can understand about life from studying things like comets. And I hope this almost doesn't need any introduction. This is a fairly iconic uh, image of the comet 67P that we're, uh, um, we're going to as part of the Rosetta mission. And, uh, uh, I think you can imagine that a uh, bit of a scary looking object really, not uh, quite what we had in mind. Um, and uh, I'll probably be referring it to as 67P, but its full name is Churyumov Gerasimenko. Um, and I want you to just bear in mind that, that, that the image of this, uh, of this thing, this object, which we call the cometary nucleus. Um, because I'm sure if you, any of you have been lucky enough to see comets, or you've seen pictures of them or whatever, um, you, you, you've seen something like this, which is a, a body with a, with a nice long tail that can be visible in the night sky. You, you'll never actually see one that looks like this with a naked eye. You need a, a long exposure on it, but um, that's what they look like. And I want to illustrate how long that tail is. And to do that, I'm going to take a geological map of the British Isles, and I'm going to superimpose on that um, in inverted colours now, the, the comet's tail running from Land's End to John O'Groats. Uh, I was a bit nervous when I first put this together because, uh, you know, there was a fear that that bit at the top might belong to a different country by the, by the time I go. <laughs> um, so, OK, so bear that in mind. That, that's, imagine that comet tail goes all the way uh, across the British Isles. Then the thing, the object that's making all that stuff 
is about that size. In fact, that's, that's an exaggeration. It's more like that size. Um, and that is a, a, a shape model there of, uh, of 67p. And uh, if you're interested, that's the, uh, the ESA project scientist and the lander manager having some fun at the uh, comet arrival uh, press conference. So think about that. You've got something that big that's making that huge tail. The huge tail you can see from Earth. The biblical flood was 40 days and 40 nights of, of torrential rain. And, uh, Great, and that makes sense too because the, the plasma discharges would cause rain, wouldn't they, in, in your theory? Well, the, the, the comet tail, we passed uh, 40 days and 40 nights. I figured that, for example, if we as planet Earth passed through the tail of comet hale -Bopp, which was a possibility, right. uh, uh, just say that the orbital situation was correct, we would have spent about 35 days in the comet tail. And then a little rain, wow. we'd have uh, torrential rains, the, the naphtha, the rain of, uh, of uh, brimstone and fire. And so, at any rate, uh, the Noah's flood is very realistic. We passed through the tail of a big comet, 40 days and 40 nights. And yeah. gee, how did, how did Noah know this was going to happen? How did he know to build a boat? Well, because someone back there well, uh, had the knowledge uh, to know that this thing was coming. And he built his boat out in the middle of nowhere. And people were laughing at him. You right. Know, it's, it's what you he was do. building he in built. a desert area. So think about that. You've got something that big that's making that huge tail. The huge tail you can see from Earth. Um, but in actual fact, what we're interested in doing is going and finding out what it is that's making that tail. And that is quite a small object that actually is about something like three or four kilometers across in, a, in actual size. As I say, the, the theme is, what is life? Oh, no, no, the theme is life. And so I thought I'd introduce my talk by kind of, you know, uh, by tackling the question, what is life? And I'll start by showing that. Um, some of you might recognize that. This was a feature that was found in a, in a Martian meteorite almost 20 years ago uh, that was at the time interpreted as a biological fossil. So this was evidence for life on Mars. 20 years later, I can tell you that opinions, uh, uh, minds are very definitely made up, uh, but opinions are still divided. So after all that time, with the world's experts looking at this, we still can't agree on exactly what that thing is. So that shows that it's a difficult issue. Do you need for a, a, a planetary body to be habitable, to, to be suitable for life? I mean, do you think you need an atmosphere? Do you need to have oxygen? Do you need liquid water? Do you need sunlight? Do you need a source of energy? Now, which of those do you think are essential requirements for life? Well, here's what I think. You don't need an atmosphere. Uh, you don't need organisms breathing oxygen. We do, as far as we know, need liquid water. It's a wonderful solvent. All cells depend on water and so on. So you need temperature where liquid water is going to be available. Sunlight. You know, plants depend on sunlight. No plants, we'd starve. Well, fine. But there are ecosystems on the Earth which don't need sunlight. You do need an energy source, some kind of chemical gradient that life can grab hold of and use for its metabolism. That's all you need. You need water and an energy source, fundamentally, for life. And we do have water. And we do have energy sources inside certain moons, which is why moons are good candidates for life. And here's an environment on Earth. Um, it's the floor of the deep ocean. This column here being built up by chemicals precipitating is a metre or so long. And this is the plume of turbid water with precipitates forming in it. These are black smokers on the deep ocean floors. And there are, there's white scum around there, which is bacteria. There are few shrimp and crabs and things scavenging around, feeding on the bacteria. There's a whole ecosystem down there that's independent of sunlight. And um, this is a favoured environment for where life on Earth could have first began. Ian showed a picture of kind of volcanic springs at the solid atmosphere interface. But put an ocean in between, you're protected from horrible ultraviolet sunlight or other kinds of harmful radiation. 
and you can start forming life even when the Earth is still being bombarded by quite a lot of meteorites if you're down at the bottom of the ocean. And if you look at the phylogenetics of life on Earth, the last common ancestor we can find is an organism that lives in hot um, environments like this and doesn't breathe oxygen either. So this is a good setting for life to begin on the Earth. And we've got settings like that, we think, inside various icy bodies. So if life could begin on the Earth, it could begin inside these icy bodies. So these are called, there's chemical energy there at the interface, and these things are called hydrothermal vents. Mars today, bone dry, with a few trickles of water coming out now and then, but the surface is certainly pretty hostile for life. It's bathed in UV radiation. There might be things underground if you dig for them, but you're not, it's worth looking for life on Mars, don't get me wrong. Uh, Everything formed in the ecliptic should be in the ecliptic. Nothing should be out of the ecliptic, and yet comets come from all over the place. So they had to be removed out to where they are some kind of way, but we don't have any idea. So they come up with this fantastic thing called the Oort cloud, which is so far away you can't imagine. It, it, the Oort cloud is one of the biggest jokes out there, and that's how they explain comets, because they can't explain them any other way. But the problem with comets is they have water in them. And anything out in space is not going to produce water. You produce water by being a cooling planet with lava spewing up the steam and stuff like that, and it condenses, etc. So comets have to begin in a planet. Where are all the strange meteors are coming from? They all hail from the asteroid belt, but not from a single location in the asteroid belt, said Bill Cook of the Meteoroid Environment Office at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. There is no common source for these fireballs, which is puzzling. There have been five or six notable fireballs that might have dropped meteorites around the United States alone. Germany and Japan have also had notable sightings. February 1st, a meteor lit up the skies over central Texas, putting on a dazzling show for people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It was extremely bright and took eight seconds to cross the sky, said I witnessed Aaron Moore and thought I could see the fireball start to slow down, then it exploded like a firecracker artillery shell into several pieces, flickered a few more times, and then slowly burned out. As bright as the full moon, the fireball in was spotted by NASA cameras in New Mexico, more than 500 miles, 805 kilometers, away. It was likely caused by an object three to six feet, one to two meters, wide, NASA researchers said. These fireballs are particularly slow in penetrating, meteor expert Peter Brown, a physics professor at the University of Western Ontario, said in a statement. They hit the top of the atmosphere moving slower than 15 kilometers per second, 33,500 miles per hour, decelerate rapidly and make it to within 50 kilometers, 31 miles, of Earth's surface. And the meteors have kept coming. My question is what is knocking our asteroid belt around out there? Family saw him. It did not last more than 8 or 9 seconds, and then disappeared, said a spokesman Guy Sussex County, Delaware. Frankly. I did not think too much about it, he says, but became concerned when he published it in the web of the local media. Triggered a rapid and overwhelming. That was just the tip of the iceberg of what was going to happen that night. Throughout Friday night, every few seconds a message appeared on Twitter from someone who had seen the meteor. Some of the messages were from the cities of New York and Washington. Dabu 7, we've had a huge fireball over Oregon today. Uh, the news here is reporting that uh, multiple people got shots of this and sent in pictures, and they wasn't sure exactly what this object was. This first shot, I mean, I'm not sure if we're looking at chemtrails here or what, and there's a, there's a streak here, but there's an object right here in the frame and I'm not sure what this is if this is what they were seeing there's no trail off of it uh, there's no smoke there's no nothing and that is way too large to be a bird uh, for a bird to look like that it had to be somewhere up here in this tree line somewhere up in this area not way out there like that if I mean I guess it could be a possibility but I'm not sure if that's the object we're talking about or not uh, when looking at the other pics it is clear 
this is the fireball that they are talking about. Um, this pick is similar to the other, but there's no nothing up here. This is a very good shot here. Almost pyramid type structure as it comes crashing down to earth. Almost pyramid type structure. See it once again there. And again here. So, very interesting indeed. Fireball over Oregon in the shape of a pyramid. I'll leave links as always. Space is not going to produce water. You produce water by being a cooling planet with lava spewing up the steam and stuff like that, and it condenses, etc. So, comets have to begin in a planet. Now, this explains it, I think, plausibly well. Nothing that they will throw at you to explain comets will do it. All right, number two, the other great mystery, the asteroid belt. What they say is that the inner viscous magma inside Tiamat in the collision was strung out the bowels of the planet. The guts were ripped out and strung out and broke into little pieces. That's the asteroid belt. They called it the hammered bracelet. We call it the asteroid belt. But there it is. And that's a fairly plausible explanation for it. Again, this doesn't make sense because, as you heard, the exploded planet theory. Problem is, when a planet explodes, it ought to just go boom everywhere. It shouldn't be hanging around. Doesn't make sense for a number of reasons. Okay. Now, the third one is uh, Pluto. Pluto's a problem because... It's, as you've all been hearing lately, they're trying to downgrade it. It doesn't belong. It doesn't fit. It has an orbit that's not like the others. It carries inside the orbit of Neptune, and it's 17 degrees off the ecliptic. Again, nothing should be off the ecliptic. What they say is that Nibiru, as it swung around, it pulled Pluto away from Saturn, its original home, and dropped it out where it is now. Now, all astronomers know Pluto is not a natural planet. It, got, it started life as a moon of an inner planet. They know that. But they have no idea how it could have gotten moved out to where it is. Here you go. Here's a reasonable answer right here. Now, let's talk about Earth. Three great mysteries here. Life. Well, first of all, let's establish that Earth is a remnant of this. What happens is Nibiru's moon bangs into the remnant of Tiamat and, like pool balls, boop, hitting, knocks it inside the orbit of Mars, and it reestablishes there and becomes the Earth, the remnant of Tiamat. Now, Earth has a, one great mystery is life. How did life come to be? Life appears, despite what you're told about the lightning bolt into the, into the pre primordial uh, soup and all that, forget it. That's just a joke. That's just a fantasy fairy tale to tell people that don't want to know the truth and to tell kids in school. That's what they're teaching to this day. We know very well that the first forms of life to appear on Earth appear suddenly. They're very sophisticated bacteria, prokaryo prokaryotic bacteria, and there's not one, there's two kinds, and they appear at around four billion years ago. Suddenly, overnight, strata without, strata with, two kinds, sophisticated bacteria, relative to what that first living form would have been. If I had done the first part of my show, you would see all that. Okay, you can get the tape or let, get one tape and put it in a room and let everybody see it if you want to. But anyway, the point is, life is a great mystery. How it would suddenly appear four billion years ago, here you go. It says in the tablets, in the collision between Nibiru and Tiamat, in the mingling of their waters, Nibiru passed life to Tiamat, to the remnant of Tiamat. Perfect explanation for the sudden appearance of two sophisticated life forms on the remnant. Now, the remnant now is over here with its moon, Kingo, Kingu, and has gone over, and now we're looking at two major differences in Earth and all other astral bodies out there. Earth is missing a huge portion of its crust, and it has plate tectonics, movement in the plates. How could that happen? No explanation. Why? Because in the vacuum, any liquid in a vacuum, what does it do? You see it in the space shuttle all the time. They let orange juice or milk. It makes the smallest, tightest ball it can make. That is what a liquid does in a vacuum. Smallest, tightest ball it can make. Now, that is what all the other astral bodies have done. They don't have plate tectonics. There's nowhere for the plates to go. They're as tight as they can be. 
Where do plate tectonics come from? In the collision, the backside of Tiamat is cracked like an eggshell. Cracked like an eggshell. There are the plates. There are the plates. And when it, the missing crust, of course, is when it, the, the half is there, it's still viscous. It's still magma. So what's it going to do? It's going to tighten itself down into a new ball, much smaller than the old one had been. And what's going to happen? It's going to have a big chunk gone, a big missing piece of itself, a big hole in itself, in its skin. And so it, that scar is going to break up into pieces as the plates move around, and we have the plate tectonics, and we have the missing surface that we know about today. Next slide, please. And we'll take a look at just a representation of what it looks like with the water gone. Not to scale, of course, but you get the idea. This is not like any other planet or moon out there. Something happened. And I think the Enuma Elish gives a plausible explanation for what that was and for all the other things that I mentioned as well. Next slide. Now, when the dust settled, here's what we had. The solar system as we know it today, with Nibiru moving in this clockwise 3,600-year orbit, and I say it, was, and it passes outside the orbit of Mars, inside the inner edge of the asteroid belt, and the last time we threw, I think, was around 200 B.C., which means it's just past Aphelion out here, and it's going to be back around 3400 A.D., about 1400 years. We don't have to worry about it if I'm right. You will get arguments about these dates. Some people use textual interpretations. I use the date of the last, uh, the ending of the Ice Age, which I believe was caused by Nibiru passing through and lifting the tides. You can read about why I think that in the book. And I use the dating of the ice cores and the tree rings of science. I try to make my work as scientifically based as I can because I expect someday to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those guys, and I want to be able to do it on their turf in their terms. Okay? So, next slide. All right. This is some of the proof for what that story that you've just heard. And it starts with cylinder seals. And I just want you to see what a cylinder seal is. There are about 5,000 of these that we have. They were their printing press. It was just a, a thing they would roll out on the clay to leave little pictures like this. Now, when they had a story to tell, they told it in the tablets like you saw. But when they had an event that everybody would know the event, like I showed you that cartoon, and everybody here, we all knew in a very small space that was talking about millions of words and thousands of volumes about evolution. Am I right? We all knew. Well, that, they would all know this was the story of the time the gods or whoever gave the water to the water buffalo or whatever. The point is, notice the fine detail in the best of the cylinder seals and then realize that these are basically two to three inches high. They're like big spools of thread. Made out of precious and semi-precious stone, carved in a circular format so that they roll out flat and three-dimensionally. Now, when asked how this was done, science says, well, they could only have bored little holes into the rock and then abraded them out like they, you know, to the degree that they wanted. Well, you know, the sand would be bigger than the holes you need to do this. Some of this work anyway. There, there's just no way. Lasers, this is not even an inch square here. Lasers would have a hard time doing this if they could do it. Nobody knows how they did this. They're just pulling one out of the hat on you. Okay, next slide. This is the one I want you to see. This is a much older one, much more worn, as you can see. 4,500 years, 4,500 years, 2,500 B.C. It's called the, it's VA 243. It's in a museum in Berlin. It's well dated. And it's called the Granting of the Plow. This is a seated God. See him in his chair with a plow in his hand. And this is a standing God, and this is a human. How do we know they're gods? Because they have horns on their helmets. Horns on their helmets. Notice the horns. This is how you signify gods, or they did anyway, the Sumerians did on their cylinder seals. And I want you to pay special attention to this because later at the banquet we might see a real live Anunnaki helmet. We might see that. Okay, now, normally they would put astrological signs, I'm excuse me, astronomical signs up here to indicate who the god was because not everybody would know. But in this one, obviously, everybody knew. And as you can see, this kind of, the, the human is carrying this kind of skunky old digging stick that the, the most primitive people have, even to this day. And this new wooden plow here, 4,500 years ago, we can go to Egypt today and see this very plow, and in many other third world countries still being used, this very plow. Okay, so no question it's the granting of the plow. But this is what makes this special right here. Let's see a blow up of that. What is this? 
Solar system, right. Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, in their relative sizes, mind you. Earth, Moon, think how small that is. What grain of sand dug that out? Mars, and then, uh-oh, what should be here? This should be the asteroid belt. This is Nibiru, folks. Nibiru. Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto as a moon of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Notice that it's only a little bit bigger than Uranus, Neptune. It's about three times bigger than Earth. Nibiru is a good-sized planet. Good-sized planet, according to this. Okay? Now, again, what proof do we have of any of this? Let's take some look. Let's take a look at this. All right. Here's a look at the solar system that you don't get to very often. And did it occur to any of you that we were looking at a cylinder seal carved at 4,500 years ago that had Uranus in it that we only discovered in 1781 when our telescopes got good enough to see it. It had Neptune, when we discovered in 1846 when our telescopes got good enough to see it, and Pluto, which we discovered in 1930 when our mathematicians got good enough to tell our astronomers where to look for the thing because it was so small. What are the Sumerians doing knowing about that? Furthermore, what are they doing writing in one of their tablets that if you look at these two, Uranus and Neptune, in the heavens, meaning right out on them, they look like blue-green watery twins. When we didn't find that out, we thought they were just big old gas bags like Jupiter and Saturn until Voyager went out there in 86 and 89 and found that, lo and behold, they really are blue-green watery twins. What the Sumerians said 4,500 years ago. Furthermore, they didn't count the way we do. Earth was not the third rock from the sun for them. It was number seven. So that means they were counting from out here and they were putting Pluto in its correct place. What are they doing with all that knowledge? Well, they make no bones about it. They say everything that we know, everything that we are, everything that we have comes from the people living on Nibiru. The people living on Nibiru came to Earth and gave us everything that we have, everything that we know, our great culture. Now, what's the proof of that? Is there any proof that any ancient, advanced civilization was ever on Earth at any point in the dim or distant past? Yes, yes. The megalithic structures out there, the pyramids, Tiwanaku, Baalbek, Teotihuacan, Stonehenge, you name it. A couple of dozen of them. All of those are impossible for human beings to recreate today. And yet we are told in another one of these great fantasies that they were somehow created by people in ancient times, ancient Egyptians or ancient Sumerians or anybody. Somehow or, way or other they did it. And it's just absolute malarkey. Impossible. Now, some, Egyp Next slide. some Egyptian scholars tried to prove it by getting down in with some pink granite here and wailing away with some stones for a few hours and tore their hands up and walked out of there saying, well, you know, we couldn't make much of a dent in it, but boy, you know those old folks, they sure had a lot of time on their hands, and somehow they figured out a way to do it. Wouldn't give an inch after this. Wouldn't give an inch. It's ridiculous. Now, here's the stone they're working on. Next slide. Some of you may have seen this. This is an ancient 1,170-ton obelisk lies unfinished at the Aswan Quarry. A crack rendered the stone unusable. It's pink granite. They were making it into an obelisk like the one you saw in Allen's slides. Okay? It's about 100 feet long. It's about 12 feet wide, 12 feet deep on the side. Imagine the Washington Monument just squared off. And it's pretty much done. But now let's, let's move this from the Stone Age... Let's move it through the age of copper because copper wouldn't make a dent in that. And let's move it into the Bronze Age. Bronze will, will, will chip on it. Bronze will take a little bit of it out. Now, let's put our bronze chisels or hatchets or whatever in the hands of some guys and get them down in this crack and put them to work. How do you think they're going to fare in there? Pretty tight fit. Plastic man might have a tough time up in there. But the point is they've got it pretty much done. They're working on the spire here. When they break it, you know how it works. You press here, you get this. Well, look, does this look like somebody chipping away with a little hand? No. This looks like a belt sander taking pieces out the size of the chair you're sitting on. Huge chunks of pink granite, one of the hardest stones in the world, just being ripped out. And they press too hard with whatever machine they've got here. And you know your physics. You get stress back here, and they popped it. They broke it. And they just said, whoops, we busted that one. And they just unhooked it. 
and went somewhere else and left it for us to marvel at and wonder how they could have done it. But now let's go ahead and say they didn't bust it and they finished it. These primitive people now who managed somehow to do this. They finished it. It's ready to go. The hole, by the way, is about 15 feet deep. That's the top of it up there. But still, what's the first thing they've got to do? They got, somebody's got to draw straws to get down there with the hatchet and cut it loose from the bottom. Now, who's going to do that with 1,100 tons sitting on top of him? We could not get our best diamond tip blades to cut through underneath this thing. The weight would stop the blade. We could not, the, word, the operative word here is impossible. We could not get this out of here. And yet they did it time and time and time again. To lift it out, just if we could somehow cut it loose, we would have to take a dozen of our largest movable cranes to ring that hole just to get it up. You're being lied to, folks. That's the main thing you've got to understand. You're being lied to. It's absolutely impossible for this one stone, this one stone proves that none of the megaliths were made by those people in that era. And this, again, is not the biggest one. They have been involved back twice that big. Exact same thing again. There's a sky tower. Clear sky. I'll try and zoom as far into it as I can without it being shaky, people. Oh. It's on a tr tripod, but what is that? I did miss that again. I mean, it's massive. That is big. Because you look at it and it's away in the distance, and then you bring it to the fort and it's just going to disappear underneath the cloud. But that's big, and it's certainly bigger than it was the last time. Fourth of August, we've got it back again. Fifth of August. What's the day's date? Fifth of August. Same thing. Two tails. Same position in the sky. Definitely not a plane. We'll lose it soon underneath the clouds.
tell me that's a plane. That's still the the tails are the tails are facing up and down anyway. So I mean that tells you it's not a plane. Look. Look. Here. Oh aye. And there is no prisoner more pathetic, say, more, no slave more pitiable than a prisoner or a slave who thinks that he or she is a free person. We are not. And it's high time all of us were aware of this fact. There are those who walk amongst us as human beings but who are more than human beings? There are such things as gods, and they walk amongst us. They control our destiny. They control us through newspapers. They control us through money. And they control us through religion and spiritual confusion. And that guys what the what whoa hello hello <clears throat> excuse me look oh oh she's i too what the what was that 
Is that just a camera? I don't think so, guys. Wilbur Allen, fotógrafo de National Geographic, captó varias imágenes con tecnología de última generación, evidencia que sorprende no solo por su calidad, también porque podrían demostrar que en los cielos ocurren hechos casi imperceptibles para el ojo humano, pero captados gracias a las últimas tecnologías. Esta es la historia. El 4 de julio de 2013 en los Estados Unidos, impresionantes imágenes de un fenómeno desconocido fueron captadas por Wilbur Allen, quien desde el 2008 es fotógrafo profesional de la prestigiosa revista National Geographic. Esta secuencia de fotografías fueron tomadas en el área de Sedona, en el estado de Arizona. Estas extrañas luces fueron descritas por Wilbur Allen, quien aseguró que el objeto luminoso volaba rápidamente hasta que se detuvo de manera intempestiva en el aire. Incluso el fotógrafo de National Geographic aseguró en el programa Uncovering Aliens de Animal Planet que no tenía duda de que este objeto fuera controlado de manera inteligente. En el mismo programa llevaron las fotografías de Wilbur Allen con un experto, quien después de realizar varias pruebas determinó que las evidencias de Allen eran completamente reales. Pero esta no es la única ocasión en que Wilbur ha logrado captar evidencia como esta. Un ejemplo de ello son estos videos grabados en Washington con cámaras que toman 60 cuadros por segundo con lentes de 20 milímetros y que, según lo que nos comentó en su canal de YouTube, tiene una mayor definición de imagen que incluso las usadas por la NASA. El primero de estos videos fue grabado el 10 de abril de este año en el que se puede observar el cielo despejado de la capital estadounidense cuando de pronto la monotonía del cielo se vio interrumpida por estas dos esferas lumínicas. Un fenómeno muy parecido al que se presentó el 5 de mayo. Y el 19 del mismo mes, otra vez. Por si fuera poco, seis días después una maniobra similar fue grabada en pleno vuelo en Washington, D.C. Pero hay más, ya que el 13 de agosto, Wilbur Allen volvió a captar con sus cámaras de alta tecnología lo que a simple vista parecía una estrella fugaz. Pero cuando el fotógrafo de National Geographic minimizó la velocidad de los videos, se logra ver con claridad un objeto cilíndrico. Además, este objeto cilíndrico no tiene apariencia de ninguna nave de la que se tenga conocimiento. Tampoco es parecido a una estrella fugaz. Observe la diferencia. ¿Qué serán los objetos captados por las cámaras de Wilbur Allen? ¿Será que los avances tecnológicos de nuestra era nos ayuden a darnos cuenta de lo que en verdad ocurre en nuestro universo? Preguntas que al parecer cada vez estamos más Mars. Uh, Mars atmosphere will change. Something Mars has a very faint atmosphere right now. Mars will have a different atmosphere by the time this comet passes and leaves. Uh, we may see electrical discharging between the comet and Mars. All of these things uh, in standard science right now is just about as quiet as a church mouse over all of these issues. Uh, because they've been saying all along comets are dirty snowballs. Uh, don't worry about these little icy wanderers, this kind of thing. And this, this comet could be the one where the public looks up in the sky and says, hey, NASA, that ain't no little snowball, what it's doing. And then... Yeah, it's going to be 15 times brighter than the moon, so they're yeah. not going to be able to ignore it. And, of course, if you look at even pictures through the Middle Ages, uh, pictures of comets that were painted into, you know, art during the Renaissance and before... These were major harbingers of destruction. They were not considered uh, really friendly things to happen in the sky. Right, and that's historical. And uh, the, the hardest, the most, uh, the effort that NASA has put into anything over the past, oh, since the 1970s, or even before, back to the 50s, it, uh, before NASA even existed, the astronomy community has tried to persuade the public that comets are really nothing to worry about. They're just those little puffy things out there, nothing to worry about. And yeah. everything in our history tells us that these things, the big ones, uh, NASA always wants to quote little comets and no, oh, nothing happened. Uh, but uh, throughout history, we have seen major things happen when big comets come through the solar system. So they fail to differentiate between big and small. There's a lot of uh, soft shoe dancing going around here 
about this topic. But the first good electrical interaction with this comet with the planet is going to actually be with comet or with planet Earth. And this is January 15th, so we could, we'll probably get our first reading of the strength of this comet. Uh, yeah, so in other words, there's going to be a plasma discharge across the interstellar space. And uh, there's also a comet coming by that's going to be about 197 meters across. They say 5,000 miles uh, above the surface of the Earth, but every time they recalculate, it gets closer and closer. It used to be 100,000 miles, uh, which is you know a little less than half the distance to the moon, or you know, one half L LD or lunar distance, and now it's getting closer and closer. But they stopped two and a half months ago releasing the data. Uh, it appears that the military and the government don't want us to know about near Earth objects anymore. It's now considered all classified. Why is that? Well, yeah, it's it's a program. If you look at what I'd call the commercial side of NASA, the part headed by uh, David Morrison, uh, that's the part that they feed to the public. And once David Morrison said in public that they don't have any equipment. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you're the near-Earth object resource group for, the, for NASA and you don't have any equipment? But on uh, Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii, the military has some of the most incredible optical and infrared astronomical, astronomical equipment in the world and it's hooked to the biggest supercomputer in the world for calculations but like you say this information does not get out to the public it's, a, it's all black op we have for example iras which is the infrared telescope wise which is a wide angle space telescope for looking at infrared we've got the chandra x-ray telescope we have the uh, stereoscopic telescopes looking at solar activity we have the south pole telescopes etc and none of this information is coming out to the public about whether there's near Earth objects, objects out in the Oort cloud, like Sedna that was identified a few years ago. Uh, this is very disturbing because it will affect the Earth. And well, some of these near Earth objects are whipping by at incredible high velocity, 35,000 miles an hour. And they're not little. They're, you know, they're several hundred meters in size or larger. This object that uh, was posted up, which we, we said passed the sniff test, but we can't find anything more about it, about this Canadian astronomer and, and uh, astronaut that said there was an 800-meter object that was heading toward Antarctica. You know, those things, it's almost like you got to grab them when you see them, because when you go back, they're not there, and that's all you're going to ever see on it. Yeah, apparently but, somebody uh, said they saw it, but they, I never saw what's called a screenshot. That's also something missing. No screenshot of the actual data, although I've seen video clips of this astronaut talking about near-Earth objects and very upset, very energized over the fact we don't have a very advanced, collaborative, you know, worldwide defense of Earth like, uh, like Linda LaRouche talks about space program. I know Space Command, which is U.S. and Canadian, basically has very little participation from even the European space agencies and none from Russia or China. And as a result, we're not really presenting information to the typical scientists at universities or feeding back information to people like yourself that can convey it or explain it to the public so they can understand that, yes, space weather and these space objects are dangerous. The things that can end life on Earth are plasma effects, gravitonic effects, coronal mass ejections, and giant objects that whip by our planet that ended the life of the dinosaur 62 million years ago. Right, exactly, and, and I like that you, you're mentioning that uh, something I've said all along, that these objects don't have to hit Earth. No. They can pass by and cause a lot more damage. The bigger ones uh, can cause tremendous damage, and they don't hit us at all. Well, they could do something like uh, cause our magnetic field to flip or, or collapse temporarily. And that could allow cosmic background radiation. Uh, you could have a coronal mass ejection triggered by the sun that could be hit us. You're using gravity as an accelerator the same way these planetoids or planetary sized objects could be accelerating and whipping comets into the inner solar system periodically if their orbits cross uh, mi billions of these comet sized uh, snowballs out in the deep space in the Oort cloud. Um, is that a possibility? Well, ex exactly, yeah. The, uh, we don't know what's out there. Uh, I think NASA has a good reading on it, and, and I have to clarify this, too, that uh, I have defined what I call Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 science. The, the public, or what the public thinks is top layer of science in the world, NASA, etc., is really Tier 2. And that's the garbage science that's passed off to the public, which is very little. Pretty pictures right. from the Hubble Space Telescope every now and then. Tier 1 science is funded by groups which include the people who run the International Monetary Fund, 
in the world banking and what I call secret societies, the people that really control what's going on. And throughout history, leaders, real leaders of the world have always known they have to keep the public stupid about science and engineering to maintain power. So right. uh, when I say NASA knows, I would say that tier one layer, that upper layer, that's the mill, I would call it the military side of NASA. They know, they have information, but they're not passing it down to the other second layer scientists uh, yeah. or to the public. Uh, I remember, I'm going to quote one of my uh, PhD colleagues at high level security <clears throat> clearance, and he said many years ago, back in the mid 90s, he said to me that uh, 4% of the knowledge is that tier two that goes to the levels of tenured university professors in physics and astrophysics, etc. In any university from Cambridge to around the world, 96% of the sum total of advanced knowledge is on a need-to-know basis and you're only invited in there in these secret orders to have specific compartmentalized information. And some of this yep. is very ancient and it's extremely well funded because, for example, the money that's been printed up by, the, say, the Fed Reserve is trillions and trillions of dollars in, in projects that people just can't even imagine exist, but they do. It's not science fiction, they exist. Just, and some of the stuff is even open, like the WISE telescope, the infrared telescope, got IRAS, the conjoint project between Germany and America to put a Boeing jet up with a uh, infrared telescope of 40 to 50,000 feet to see at that level there's very little tropospheric interference with infrared analysis of deep space objects. Uh, they know far more than they're saying and then you just have to look at their behavior. Why are they not telling the public? Because they're not preparing us for major earth changes, plasma effects, gravitonic effects, volcanic effects, uh, even effects on the uh, magnetosphere that could cause the South Atlantic anomaly to cause a major collapse that could have major effects on the oceans or on populations like in uh, Rio de Janeiro and uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, where if that descended to the ground, it would kill people almost instantly. And people are not aware of this. They just start going to work and thinking everything's fine. And the global elite don't even tell you that when the South Pole anomaly hits, if it gets lowered into the range where commercial aircraft are flying, they would lose control of their aircraft because the background space radiation would fry their integrated circuits of their airline control and their communications. It's just they don't tell anybody anything, do they? No, and, and that's really true. Uh, so we're living like uh, like laboratory rats, if you will, and it's a it's a bad comparison, but it's really true. Yeah. And uh, the uh, I just saw today I was looking up on the comet C two thousand twelve S one, and uh, that if you look on Google, which is a controlled search engine, you come up with Scientific American as the top thing, and you would think, gee, that must be the top scientific information on this object, but it's all fluffy duff. Uh, uh, you know, mumbo jumbo, and it really, they, they absolutely it, it, uh, don't talk about this thing coming near Mars. Why right. would you not talk about this thing coming near Mars when that's a major event? Mars is going to be in the coma of this thing. It's going to come close. It's going to change the orbit. But they talk about it like it's, uh, it's just going to pass by, and they, they don't even mention Mars. One of the things that's going to stop a lot of this is citizen astronomers, citizen scientists, I can do all kinds of experiments, like and we had talked about Stan Dale with his gravitonic experiments. As citizen astronomers have some pretty powerful scopes and technologies that can look at the sun, can look at deep space, and are going to start identifying anomalies that uh, they're going to start adding one and one together. And yeah. when they look at your models, the models that you've put out scientifically that explain this, it's going to blow the lid off the fact that the governments are conspiring to keep the public in the dark at our peril. And that's the big part is it's at our peril, peril of crops, populations, communication systems, power grids, uh, coastal areas, all kinds of things. Because if you have, say, an ocean strike of a large uh, asteroid or comet, you're going to have a tsunami half a mile high. Uh, if you have a, a, this, like this story, which we get, said passed the sniff test, of a 800-meter comet striking Antarctica, if it hit the Ross Ice Shelf or the, uh, the Northern Ice Shelf in Antarctica, you could have major effects on the oceans of the world. But they're not going to tell us anything, and they're going to say everything's fine, and the, 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 the ether of normalcy is, is permeating the population to tell us, just go back to sleep, everything's fine, you're not going to have a Carrington event that would cause the fires of papers by somebody's uh, telegraph machine to go on fire or rail ties to burn uh, 150 years ago, that that couldn't happen again. Of course, these events happen on a century basis regularly from the sun. This is nothing anomalous. It's not a millennial or, or decamillennial event. It's something that happens on a century basis. 
Yeah, oh, exactly. But it's see, it's a comet like this it, that could come in, and the people look up in the sky, and every, I mean, and the, imagine this comet if it produces what they are predicting, and which I think it can do. In the oh, daylight, boy. you see something 15 times brighter than the full moon. Wow. And stretching across the sky with tails wheeling around and zapping electrical discharges off to little objects in space. And people can see this. Now, okay, you're the military trying to say, okay, now that's a fluffy little snowball up there, boys and girls. You know, it's just going to blow the lid off everything. And that's why... Uh, now, here's a good example. Whenever there's a comet... Uh, like Comet Ellen, and there was all kinds of hype and misinformation, and there were people jumping up and down, and all kinds of uh, controlled websites say, giving misinformation would be the end of the world. What's interesting is there's none of that, none at all, with this comet. And those, a lot of those sites, I'd say the majority, are very controlled. So the controlled, uh, the end of the world is going to happen with this comet. Those websites are quiet as a church. Yeah, the, the other thing is, too, a lot of these issues have to do with energy, and one of the biggest controlling factors on the public today is world energy. Uh, what I've been teaching for a long time is there's a tremendous amount of energy, electrical energy, passing by Earth, and we know how to tap into it. I know how to do this, uh, but yeah. uh, you and uh, the, the black ops people, I've, I get to talk to them occasionally, and uh, I had a naval f physicist come up to me one day. I was giving a talk in 2003. And uh, I had mentioned that the naval submarines are using bimetal strips as power, and that's a way they can derive power for the, their propellers and go run silent, run deep type of mode. And he came up to me after the talk and he says, you can't talk about this anymore. He says, so you figured out what we're doing but uh, you can't talk about it anymore. And, and then he said, you know, I'm amazed at what you're doing. He said, just doing what you're doing. Uh, yeah, in other words, what you're talking about is energy from a vacuum. In other words, the uh, the, the vortex, the dark field energy matter, the ma that, that literally flows around the Earth and literally creates the substance of space-time, is literally infinite energy, and there's no need yeah. for energy shortage, just the same way as we had Professor Corsi on the first hour on, on Monday this week, on the 8th, talking about the abiotic oil scam that was proven by the Nazi Germans back in the 1930s that and 40s that there's no shortage of oil but oil is a, is a minor portion of the energy needs of the planet uh, we could have plasma distribution networks, tokamak fusion reactors I know from my sources that we uh, can use helium-3 fusion reactors that would produce no radioisotopes and no byproducts and would not be dangerous and they can be miniaturized as well there's just no need for either pollution, energy shortages, which is the currency of the planet. The currency is not gold or silver or dollars or even electronic currency. It's energy. Energy is That's the correct. currency of every culture. And if you if you look at, like, say you go buy a hot dog today, how much of that hot dog price is energy to make it, to process it, to grow the corn, to get fed the, the beef or whatever, and, and you go, you look right down the line. I did an analysis one time in transportation, in the grocer, the people have to drive to go buy it. The cost of that hot dog is 80 to 90 percent energy. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, there's about less 10 than 10 percent is the actual, less than 10 percent is anything else. Yeah, and so you're paying these astronomical prices for things. Well, of course there's going to be economic chaos. How can you sustain when one branch of the society, which should be a small kind of pimple, uh, uh, like communications is another example, these should be small pimples on the side of our overall economy, yet they're the main central core of the economy. What's wrong with this picture, you know? Of course we can't be sustainable. Uh, we can't have a, a sustainable economy, or uh, um, and people are working uh, two jobs just to try and make ends meet. Well, it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's not working. Well, we need also these ideas that you mentioned about energy sources, so we can do projects like uh, geoengineer the planet to create things like the Wapa North American Energy and Water to literally change the planetary safety areas so it's safe to, put, to, to have populations in areas where there won't be in danger of a tsunami, an earthquake, or other things, and to get away from old nuclear technology, which is patently dangerous. 
Um, oh, it's terrible. It's, the people just have no idea how dangerous nuclear is. Not only the rea- the uh, the accidents, but the waste that we have stored hundreds and hundreds of casts of radioactive waste stored around nuclear power plants, and someday, and those, most of them have to be cooled. And so yeah, there's yeah. a point of no return in which you have to produce more and more energy simply to cool the spent fuel. Yeah. And if that reactor ever goes down, <laughs> those things are going to mess. Uh, yeah, you get 50 years of energy and 5 billion years of pollution. Yeah, it, it is not a good deal. No, bad, bad. And it also costs more than any other form of energy. Um, so, Professor McKinney, I want to move on to the topic of uh, the people want to know about Planet X. They want to know, firstly, I don't like to call it Planet X because we know there's many objects that are coming into our solar system. I have lots of information that indicates that the powers that be know that there's going to be major changes to our planet. The, the one that I've been told recently is uh, and confirmed over pretty years is that any kind of planetary effect from a a sister star to the to the to our sun which would probably be a red dwarf would be a plasma effect which fits in with your thesis it doesn't have to come in within 55 million miles of earth in order to have major effects on the planet and the people don't grasp that the government's purposely hiding this data uh, whatever it is because i don't know the dates but i can tell you the evidence that i've seen and information suggests that there's not only comets and asteroids, these big rocks from space, but there's also uh, planetoid-sized objects that could be coming in, or uh, in dwarf stars that can have major periodic effects. There's some pretty good evidence that every 3,600 years there's a uh, what I call a sub-extinction level event, a major Earth change event that occurs, triggered up by an object that approaches near uh, our inner solar system, and it may well be a dwarf star or one of these large planetoid-like objects, but it could be simply plasma discharges that produce a lot of these effects. Uh, can you expand on that and tell us what your theories are and what data is out there? Uh, the the 3,600 year time frame? Yes. And, and uh, any, of these, any of these cycles uh, that are out there? Because there's a bunch yeah, the, of cycles. Yeah, the, the 3,600 year ago time frame was when Venus, the comet, came through and became the planet Venus. About 4,200 years ago, Hale-Bopp was here again and had a different orbit. Uh, we think that the orbit that it had before before uh, was Earth crossing. The one it has now is actually Earth crossing. Uh, but at any rate, uh, those are two events that we know about. Um, oh, really? So, so Venus yeah. was actually a, a large uh, planetoid that actually came in and was captured in an orbit. And by Jupiter, and that's what the, the Velikovsky story that is poo-pooed by science. But what I found is, is very real. It's very, very real. Oh, yeah, um, it's spinning in the opposite direction. You look at it and you say, oh, this doesn't make sense. Every other planet is spinning in the opposite direction to Venus. And when you look at the, uh, at the nature of the size of the planet and where the way it's behaving, it doesn't behave like any of the other near-Earth object planets in the inner solar system, does it? No, uh, there was an analysis done by a chemist, by the way, uh, his name is Newell, and he analyzed the atmosphere of Venus, and he said, this is a new planet. He says, all of these chemicals are very harsh chemicals which have a, a lifetime that when cooled down, they would change into other forms. Like A planetary object carried as in orbit around another star that was coming into our solar system around 5,000 years ago, about th- or 3,600 years ago, that literally was captured by Jupiter and that this there's evidence that there is a 3600 year periodicity cycle we know that the volcanism on earth and the destruction of Thera that destroyed the Minoans we know that the debris that fell and all the environmental changes that occurred for the quote plagues of Egypt fall specifically and in in, in scientifically valid order, what you'd expect in terms of, ther- of telluric currents driving the insects and the snakes out of the ground etc Something is really a, a foot here, and I think the globalists and the scientists in this Category 1 science are trying to hide it from the public in terms of the approach of a dwarf star, either most likely a red dwarf or an object that has orbital objects around it and debris, and that this object is coming into our inner solar system and it's going to cause some havoc, and the globalists are building underground cities at an enormous pace. They're absolutely determined 
to get a new financial con- complete control matrix order over quote the civilian population, not because they're trying to save us, but because they don't want us to interfere with their continuity of civilization and government plans. I really right, believe that exactly. they're expecting an extinction level event, and they're trying to hide the fact that they've selected on specific individuals to be seed stock, like the Sakhalin Island uh, super uh, seed vault, and that they're getting ready. Uh, not telling the public, and that's why they want to have a global control system like the current administration with Obama and administrations in other countries like China, which they've supported the communist regime there. Uh, and at the same time, they're keeping the public like mushrooms in the dark and feeding us, uh, you know what? So, um, <laughs> exactly. Well, so that's, it, a, that's a good analysis, and it's, uh, uh, I would say uh, somewhere in there, you're about 99.99% right on all of that. Yeah, well, my uh, sources are. Is timing. Uh, I, I took care of a, a scientist going to McMurdo Bay back in the mid 90s. I have contacts in the South Pole Telescope. Contacts have sent me information from IRS and other sources. I know that this infrared object can be picked up with infrared telescope, telescopy, uh, X-ray telescope, telescopy, and radio telescopy, such as the Arecibo. They know it's coming in. Uh, I don't know the exact dates, but I do know it has orbital objects coming around it, which include planetary and comet size objects. Uh, what you're saying is that the Velikovsky theory is that Venus was a object that was coming in, that was literally in the orbit of this passing dwarf star and was captured by the orbit of, uh, by the gravitational field of Jupiter and the Sun, and therefore rotates in the opposite direction because it wasn't originally a, uh, if you want to call it a Sol, which is the name of our Sun solar object, it was actually a captured planetary object that's in a much earlier state of development. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, my belief on G- Venus was that exactly, Velikovsky was exactly right, and uh, that Venus and Hilbop were companions. And Venus went one way, Hilbop went the other way. They both had interactions with Jupiter around 4,200 years ago. And it took Venus about 600 years working its way through the solar system to finally become the planet. It passed by Mars, ripped the atmosphere and oceans off of Mars. And when it passed by Earth, we got a pretty good uh, lambasting there twice. According to the Mayans, we know that those two events were 54 years apart. We know a lot about this. And then eventually Venus worked its way in uh, in by a process I call tail drag the drag of the tail on the comet in the the plasma discharge comet model. My comet model shows that the the nucleus of the comet is pulling in the tail material and that creates a drag on the nucleus which changes its orbit into a more circular orbit. So at any rate, this whole process is explained and uh, uh, but that's what my vision of Venus is and it's brand new. Uh, NASA cannot uh, they've got their little rover on Mars, and they just made an announcement saying, well, gee, there must have been water, but it had to be billions of years ago. And then you look at Mars, it's got pristine little riverbeds that are uh, like the day they were had water in them. You have erosion on the side of Olympus Mons. You have sloughing off of big chunks of material off the side of the volcano of Olympus Mons, which would have been due to an ocean there. And NASA goes, well, we think there might have been water, you know. Well, if you look at it, they look like a, a swimming pool with the water drained out. You look yeah. at it, and you see rivers, you see canals. These are not man-made canals. These are canals caused by the natural flow of water on the planet. So it, it, the, the planet obviously had a cataclysmic event that ripped off its atmosphere and water. And recently, because Mars has tremendous dust storms that destroy everything in a couple of in a very short period of time, all of this geological, uh, uh, all of these features would be destroyed. And certainly over two billion years, you wouldn't see this. And the other thing is, of course, that they always show pictures, too, of Mars, where they show the sky is red, but in actual fact, if you were on the Martian surface, the sky would appear blue because that's just a principle of light. The second thing is that there probably is water deposits underneath the ground, especially in the, in the polar and subpolar areas, which means if they're going to find any form of life, bacterial or otherwise, they would find it in the subpolar areas uh, where there is some light uh, underground. Yeah, they, uh, I, I like the picture when the, the most recent lander landed and they showed the landscape. It's all these rounded hills, nice, beautifully rounded hills. It's, it's everything you saw, round pebbles. 
Everything yeah. you saw in that picture was a result of water erosion and the presence of water. And, yeah. But they just can't, they can't quite decide if there was water there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Now, the cataclysm on Earth was pretty significant, and uh, this would also fit in with the, the, the flood hypothesis about Noah and the flood, that there were cataclysmic changes to the Earth that occurred around those, those times as well. Yeah, the, the Noah's flood preceded what I, the Velikovsky Venus event was what I call the Moses event. Uh, right. And, and the, the, the Quetzalcoatl of the Incas, the Mayas, uh, the ancient Incas and Mayas, and, but the Noah event happened thousands of years earlier because the, the Old Testament of the Bible is nothing more than a genealogy of the people between Noah and Moses. Right. And, and, so, and that's all it is. It's the genealogy and the history of that event of the Great Flood. Uh, right. Oddly enough, the Great Flood is not even ta taught in history in schools today. It's like mythology. They, nobody teaches it because they don't think it even happened. And it's the, one of the most formative events in the history of all of mankind. That shows how distorted education is today. Yeah, and one of the, uh, the good theories that I've seen recently is that it was the massive flooding, that, the expansion, dramatic expansion of the Black Sea that occurred when a major barrier broke between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea through the, through the Bosporus that occurred because of the earth changes and that that great flood would accomplish be accomplished also by great floods from the sky and great earth changes in the ground because there's fault lines that run right through the Bosporus. Uh, well, yeah, but the, 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 the biblical flood was 40 days and 40 nights of, of torrential rain. And, uh, right, and that makes sense, too, because the, the plasma discharges would cause rain, wouldn't they, in, in your theory? Well, the, the, the comet tail, we passed uh, 40 days and 40 nights. I figured that, for example, if we as planet Earth passed through the tail of comet Hale-Bopp, which was a possibility, right. uh, uh, just say that the orbital situation was correct, we would have spent about 35 days in the comet tail. And then it would have rained, wow. we'd have uh, torrential rains, the, the naphtha, the rain of, uh, of uh, brimstone and fire. And so, at any rate, uh, the Noah's flood is very realistic. We passed through the tail of a big comet, 40 days and 40 nights. And yeah. gee, how did, how did Noah know this was going to happen? How did he know to build a boat? Well, because someone back there well, had the knowledge uh, to know that this thing was coming, and he built his boat out in the middle of nowhere. And people were laughing at him. Right. You know, what he was building in a desert area, basically. Yeah, and then it started to rain, and I think the, the people stopped laughing. Right. Now, what's interesting is a lot of this knowledge is passed down through the ancient, we call hey priesthood. This is probably obvious, but I thought I'd say it anyway. Stars are much bigger and much brighter than planets. So as astronomers, it's fairly easy to study stars. Studying planets, which are not in our own solar system, is rather troublesome because they're small and they're dim, so they're difficult to study. The difference in brightness between the Earth and the Sun is a factor of about 10 billion. So you're looking for something very, very faint next to something much brighter. So that presents obvious problems. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about stars that we're going to need later on. So this is probably the most important diagram in astronomy. This is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and it's a graph of, on the y-axis, the brightness of stars, on the x-axis, the colour of stars. And almost all the stars in our galaxy um, that you know, create that beautiful pattern of light that you saw in the artist's impression fall along the diagonal stripe up the middle of that diagram. And these are so-called main-sequence stars. Our sun is an example of a main-sequence star. And what all these stars have in common is that they're converting hydrogen to helium at their center, and this creates the energy that produces the sunlight and the starlight that creates light on the planets orbiting around the star. Um, our sun is about a third of the way up that stripe, and there are actually more stars lower down that are smaller, lower mass, fainter and redder. And then as you go up towards the top of that stripe, you've got more massive stars that are bluer and brighter. Okay, 
One of the things that we've learned in the last 20 years, which I think is really remarkable, is that we now know that there are actually more planets than stars in our galaxy. So when you look at the light in a galaxy, you see the starlight just because the stars are bright. But we've now done enough work on nearby stars in our own galaxy to know that actually, in general, stars do have planets orbiting around them. So there are lots and lots of planets in our galaxy. Um, we don't know about all of them in detail. The assertion that I just made that there are more planets than stars in the galaxy is based on statistics. We know of about 2,000 planets in detail, and these have been studied by astronomers over the last 20 years or so. We know of 1,137 planetary systems, or at least we did on the 9th of September. So this, these numbers are about a month out of date, so we're probably up to about 2,000 planets now, because there's quite a large number of astronomers in the world who are constantly studying, looking for new planets, and there are new, new um, announcements coming out every day. So we know in detail of about 2,000 exoplanets orbiting around stars other than the sun. And so we now know that um, planets form with stars. There's no special requirement at all. Um, 20 or, well, more than 20 years ago, it was possible still that our own solar system was unique. Something special had happened to um, the sun in its early history that created the, the material that then formed planets. But we now know that planets do generally form with stars. There's no special requirements. So we would expect the other stars, like the sun, to have planets also orbiting around them. Now, I should probably just tell you a little bit about how we found these almost 2,000 exoplanets that we know about. Because I've told you that it's very difficult to see planets because they're dim. Um, so both of the main ways that we've detected these planets depend on actually studying the light from the star and observing in the light from the star subtle effects due to the effect of the planet on the star. So you can actually, uh, you know, you think of planets orbiting around stars, but in fact, from the point of view of the laws of physics, both the star and the planet have mass, and they both orbit around their common centre of gravity, which is much closer to the heavier star than it is to the light planet. So the star itself has a little orbit, which you can detect by looking at the light from the star and looking at the Doppler shift of that light. And then there's another even more simple way of detecting a planet around a star, which is if you happen to have a planetary system that's lined up so that the orbit of the planet happens to take the planet right in front of the star from our point of view, then the planet gets in the way and blocks some of the light. So you can actually see the star get dimmer every time a planet gets in front of it. So these are the two main ways that we've detected the almost 2,000 exoplanets that we know about. Okay, so I'm now going to change gear a little bit and go back to a brief history of life on the Earth. So I'm revisiting some of the, the points that Ian and Dave have already made. So from about 4 billion to 3.8 billion years ago, the Earth was being bombarded in an early period of its history called the late heavy bombardments. It was being bashed into by all sorts of stray bits of rock and asteroids that were chaotically orbiting around in the solar system. So at this point, the Earth was probably not habitable. But the interesting thing is, rather promptly on astronomical timescales, a mere um, 300 million years after the late heavy bombardment, we can see evidence that photosynthesis was already happening on the Earth. So that implies that life got started really very quickly after the late heavy bombardment started. So this means that probably you don't require very special circumstances for life. Now, the, the rather more pessimistic thing is that complex life, of the sort of thing that, that you and I, trees, cats and dogs, that happened rather late. And this is at the very other extreme of the history of life on Earth. So it was about 600 million years ago that the first very complex life happened. So that may require rather special circumstances. So from analogy with that, it seems that probably life may be common on planets elsewhere in our galaxy, but complex life may be rather rare. OK, so Dave told us that we need a source of energy and liquid water for life. And I told you about the different kinds of stars. 
where you would need to put a planet in order to have liquid life on its surface depends on the type of star you're orbiting around. So the big, hot, blue stars have a habitable zone that's fairly large and fairly far away. The, the uh, more plentiful, cool, red stars are dimmer, and so you need a, a planet to be closer in to have a temperature consistent with liquid water. Um, but it's more complicated than that. You, you can't just put the planet in the habitable zone and say it's going to be a habitable planet. It's much more complex than that. And as we know from our own solar system, the difference between Earth and Venus is dramatic. And it depends, a, a lot depends on the atmosphere and the clouds, whether you have a dry and toxic environment like Venus or a wet habitable environment like the Earth. Um, so clouds can help, as they do on Earth, but if you have too many clouds, they can trap heat and cause a runaway greenhouse effect. So it's really rather complicated to assess whether a planet is habitable or not. Um, in the future, with more powerful telescopes, we may be able to make observations which will allow us to identify individual chemicals in the atmosphere of planets. And this gives us the potential to actually say, is there life now on the surface of this planet that we're, um, that we're observing. So, for example, on the Earth, we have oxygen in our atmosphere. Oxygen is highly reactive, and we only have oxygen in our atmosphere because it's been constantly replenished by the processes in plants on Earth. So if we were to be able to detect oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, that would be a so-called biomarker and give us a strong steer that perhaps there is, in fact, life on that planet. Now, finally, I'm going to, as, as promised, tell you a little bit about some work that we did here at the Open University. Um, so I told you that most of the stars in the galaxy are along that um, diagonal stripe in this diagram. All of those stars will eventually run out of fuel, and almost all of them will end their lives as white dwarf stars, which are in the bottom corner of that diagram. And those stars are no longer doing nuclear reactions. They're just dying embers that are cooling like coals left over after a fire. And it turns out that planets can survive around compact stellar remnants like that. And surprisingly, the way that white dwarf stars cool actually leads to conditions where you could have habitable temperatures on planets for up to 8 billion years as the white dwarf is cooling. Um, so we did a little bit of work just examining this using the real spectrum that you would expect from a white dwarf star. And we were able to calculate that if you put a planet in the right place, you could have this persistent habitable zone in which you have photosynthetically useful light, light that plants could use to generate energy, while simultaneously not having too much damaging UV radiation. So this is quite um, a, a sort of an optimistic, sort of very long-term um, picture that as all of the stars in the galaxy burn out, we could nonetheless have a galaxy that's teeming with life on planets around white dwarf stars, you know, as we look sort of 10 billion, 20 billion years into the future, the prospects for life in the galaxy are actually rather promising. So do we have questions? Uh, if you have a question, you need to wait for the microphone. Yes, there's one here. The planets that you're finding on the stars, how far away are the stars from us in light years? Ah, right. Handily. <laughs> 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 I happen to have... A, uh, so this is a, um, a sort of schematic diagram of our Milky Way um, galaxy. And there's a scale there in light years. And the distance of our sun from the center of the galaxy is indicated. So the planets that we find, their distance depends on the method used to find them. So there's a little cloud of sort of greenish points there that are clustered quite close to the sun. And those are the, those are the ones that have been found by the Doppler technique, where we're looking at the motion of the star caused by the larger motion of the less massive planet. And to do that, you need a fairly bright star because you have to spread the light out very, very um, widely. So you need a bright star to be able to do that. Then there's a, a sort of a slightly larger cloud of red points. And those have been found by transit surveys. 
So at the Open University, we were involved in, well, we are involved in the SuperWASP project, which has found quite a number of transiting planets. I think we're up to almost 200 now. And those planets are, are around stars that are slightly more distant from the sun because you just have to collect all the light from the star to find them. You don't have to do the very precise spectroscopy. And then many more have been discovered by a satellite, by a NASA satellite called Kepler, which pointed in a particular direction and made very precise measurements, again, looking for planets that are getting in the way of the star and causing a transit signal where the light dims. And because it's pointing in a particular direction, it's actually, on average, looking at fainter stars. So those are dimmer. So I've sort of schematically indicated those with the, with the blue dot. And then there's another method I haven't told you about, which uses gravitational lensing. And that tends to find things just this side of the centre of the galaxy. So that's probably a more detailed answer than you wanted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just wait for the microphone. Would there be lots of planets um, going around every one star? Like, how many on average? Would there be, like, eight or nine, like, in the solar system, or would there be lots more? That's a really good question, and that's something that astronomers are working on. So we, we don't really know at this point, because... All of our techniques require certain things in order for us to be able to find the planet. So for the, the, the transit technique, we need the planet to get in the way. And if you were to look at our own solar system, the, the planets are aligned more or less in line with each other, but not quite. So there are quite a few systems where there's sort of up to about five or six transiting planets that have been found in the same system. But you don't really know if there might be some that are just you know, misaligned a little bit, so they're just missing going in front of the star. And similarly with the Doppler shift technique, you can detect the very massive planets that cause a big wobble easily, but there could be less massive planets in the same system that we're failing to, to detect. So we do know of, of systems where there are five or more planets, but we're not sure really what the typical number is yet. That's a very good question, and you could probably still research on it, you know, when you're old enough to, <laughs> to, do, to do research at university. Hi. Your, um, your research looking at the biomarkers for planets mm -hmm. with life seems to be based around oxygen levels. Mm -hmm. If obviously you looked at the Earth, you wouldn't see oxygen levels as much with what we're looking at because it's nitrogen-based. Mm -hmm. So are you looking at it with different... Makeups like nitrogen and carbon dioxide based as well? Yeah, so what you're doing is you're looking for something that's sort of out of equilibrium where you've got to have some sort of metabolic process. Um, and I should probably also say that that's not a particular thing that I've worked on. The, the things that I've worked on are the bits that I picked out, but that's one of the, the most important general things that people are preparing to do in exoplanet astronomy in the next 10 years or so. of modern day astronomy is comets. Comets make no sense for this reason. They come from all over the place. In a linear universe, when you know the great ball of, of a primordial cloud of dust and gas swirling around flattens out into a pancake to make the solar system, that's the ecliptic. Everything formed in the ecliptic should be in the ecliptic. Nothing should be out of the ecliptic, and yet comets come from all over the place. So they had to be removed out to where they are some kind of way, but we don't have any idea. So they come up with this fantastic thing called the Oort cloud, which is so far away you can't imagine. It, it, the Oort cloud is one of the biggest jokes out there, and that's how they explain comets, because they can't explain them any other way. But the problem with comets is they have water in them. And anything out in space is not going to produce water. You produce water by being a cooling planet with lava spewing up the steam and stuff like that, and it condenses, etc. So comets have to begin in a planet. The energy beam coming through the top of the Bosnian pyramid of the sun. This right here. This energy beam has a frequency of 28 kilohertz. That's the frequency of the ultrasound 
which you cannot hear or see. It's continuous, and it shoots right above us, where we don't know. But we were able to measure it with our instruments. So this phenomenon is here. In today's society, we use ultrasound for the medical purposes. But you always have to have artificial source. It can be mechanical device, electromagnetic device, when you, you know, uh, squeeze the quartz crystal. But it's always artificial source. It seems that some of the pyramids in Bosnia are some type of the energy machine. If that's true, it means that in the distant past, they made this machine. It works even today, after thousands of years. This is a machine that never stops. This was more like science fiction in the past, but we have it here in Bosnia. Another measurements we did was the intensity of the energy beam. What we did, we had a team of the physicists from Zagreb, 10 of them. They came with the instruments and they measured the intensity on the surface of the pyramid. And then they measured it 3 meters or 10 feet higher. It was stronger. They measured another 10 feet higher, 20 feet from the bottom of the pyramid, and then it was even stronger. As you move from the center of the pyramid, the energy intensity rises. The energy is getting stronger and stronger. It contradicts all our physical laws. It contradicts our technology, which is based on so-called Hertzian technology, saying that closer to the source, the energy is stronger. In our case, you have something opposite. You're moving away from the source. Energy is getting stronger. It means that if you shoot that energy beam, it's getting stronger as it travels through the universe. It means you can reach any point in the universe. You can connect with any planet or solar system. So we are opening a complete new door in this investigation. And such a powerful, focused energy beam with its strength and intensity rising as it moves away from this planet, it's possible to hit any point in the universe. If you can make that energy bridge between two cosmic bodies, then yes, you can transport anything you want. After all, we are only the frequency. Our bodies, they're just the frequency. Our thoughts, they're just the frequency. The stone is the frequency, just different frequencies. And then the vibration can go through that energy bridge. There are different ways for transportation. For example, you know, when you have opera singer making, you know, high C, and if you have a glass in front of him, the glass will break. It means that the sound in this particular case have, you know, the properties very destructive. But imagine if you change the frequency a little bit, like on your radio, Probably the sound will have the power not to destruct, but to move the glass, to lift it, to transport it. It's very possible that people in the past, they had the knowledge how to use different frequencies for different tasks. If it can be proven that you can transport anything, anywhere, then you have the biggest discovery ever. It then took another 500,000 years before Neanderthal man mastered the concept of stone tools, and a further 50,000 years before crops were cultivated and metallurgy was discovered. Hence, he says, by all scales of evolutionary reckoning, we should still be as far removed from any basic understanding of mathematics, engineering, or science, but here we are, a mere 7,000 years later, landing probes on Mars. And he asked the all-important question, so how did we inherit this wisdom, and from whom? And then, just in case, I, again, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but just in case anybody's just straight in off the street and thinks that no alien visitors could ever visit this planet, they better read what uh, Dr. Harrison H. Brown says from CIT. He estimates that virtually every star in our galaxy is a planetary system, in each of which, right, in each of which two or four planets might have an Earth-like environment and chemistry that encourages our kind of life to exist. He gives the enormous figure of 100 billion stars with planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone, and get this, 
there are 450 billion of those galaxies. If that makes you feel small, good. But we don't have to look to scientists for that. My work is entirely based on the mythologies, uh, you know, of the ancient world, the legends. Oh, yeah, they used to say it as old, old wives' tales, so nobody paid it any mind. But we don't have to look to science to, to wait to tell us what the le our forefathers were telling us all along. The scriptures, the apocryphal works, the Gnostic texts. Isaiah 13, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, to destroy the whole land. Isaiah 6, who are these that fly in a cloud as the doves to their windows? Well, who indeed? They're known by many names all over the culture. Jack Barringer, a researcher in this very subject, who wrote a book called Past Shock, he says that there, there's at least 30,000 texts, and that's only the texts that are left after all the burnings and purgings. There's still in existence at least 30,000 texts talking about this visitation. Now, every single culture in the world, almost bar none, reveal them. The Nephilim, the Anakim, the Giants, the Titans. Uh, the Indians know them as the Nagas. The Irish knew them as the Nadreds, which is a word that means serpent. And more recently, they're known as the Brotherhood of the Snake or the Serpent People. And we'll explain that why, because there's been a lot of disinformation about that uh, from certain people within the research community. We'll clear that one up today, too. The word Nephilim actually, which is the most common name for these individuals. Uh, the etymology of a Nephilim is uncertain, but the following explanations have been advanced. First, it may derive from Nephal, which is a verb, you know, from the verb to be extraordinary or the extraordinary men. It may derive from the verb en Nepal, which means the fallen ones from heaven. Supernatural beings, you see, although it could mean morally fallen men. Take your pick. The International uh, Standard Bible Encyclopedia defines it as meaning unnaturally begotten men, you know, bastards from Nepal, abortion or miscarriage. Most modern versions of the Bible have left the word untranslated. The word also may come from Nephel, which means bad or strange birth, as I said, or from Kenephilim, which means the serpents. Now, these so-called uh, fallen angels were extremely scientifically advanced humanoid beings who came to Earth after being forced to exit their own planet or planets. They had been expunged by opposition forces and pursued across the galaxy into our solar system. And some scientists now are thinking that the, the sun, you know, uh, in the same way that even um, Frank Herbert was talking about bending space, you know, and uh, using even the sun as an event horizon. The concept is now coming into science through individuals like Nazim Haramein that uh, the sun is even a, a black hole by which you can, you know, fly between the galaxies. It's not my forte, but I just want to put that out there. So they arrived into our space, into our solar system. Upon arrival, they set up an unmanned makeshift decoy center on the planet Tiamat, which once existed between Mars and Jupiter, but they actually took refuge on our Earth here, in many of its underground caverns. Tiamat was a vast ocean planet in our solar system, known from antiquity as the second sun. It was 15 times larger than our Earth, and it was an entire ocean planet an entirely ocean planet. It wasn't a sun, but its atmosphere was so resplendent that the actual sun's rays, when shining on Tiamat, made it appear to you know, people on Earth that it was a sun. And it was known as the second sun from antiquity. If you think that's kind of odd, just remember that Venus is like the second or third brightest uh, orb in the sky and actually casts a shadow on our Earth on a moonless night. And Alan and Dallaire, in their book Cataclysm, these are top scientists from Oxford and Cambridge, um, I quote them a lot in the Atlantis book, because the science is in, by the way. This is not just some hokamania. The science is in for every single thing that you're hearing today. If we elevate the moon to planetary status, they say, as the Sumerians appear to have done, then we have a total of ten planets orbiting the sun. Now, if you're into Zacharias Sitchkin, this is all old news to you. On, the basis, on this basis, one planet is currently still missing from the earlier Sumerian total. Could there really have been another planet known to the Sumerians, as yet unknown to us or lost since their day? Well, wait a minute. Tiamat ain't there. Well, we do know what lies between Mars and Jupiter is the asteroid belt, right? That's right. Tiamat is not there today because it was destroyed by those pursuers of the Nephilim. This is what distinguishes my findings from Sitchin and from Velikovsky and others who have researched this field. Wonderful researchers, but I have found out something else, and that is that it was a humanoid. It wasn't some careering comets charging through our solar system. It was actually a humanoid intervention. The destruction of a planet 15 times larger than the Earth, made up entirely of oceans. Your enemy, you must think your enemy is pretty bad if you do that, right? But these guys were so convinced that the Nephilim were on Tiamat, they utterly obliterated, causing the almost unimaginable you know, magnetic storms and chaos in our universe. That is the event that caused 
the first flood. Tiamat's water is literally pouring down. And by the way, all the records talk about that. It's not waters coming up from below. It's waters raining down on you from the sky. Well, hell yeah. Do you know, in fact, as Alan and Dallaire have proven, that pre the deluge, pre the flood, we only had one ocean on this planet, and it was, it was called the Miocene Ocean, and the remnants of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, if you're from Russia or Slovakia or from Estonia, and from those Baltic lands, you'll know this, that the Caspian and the Black Sea have an interesting mythology. They're the remnants of the only ocean that we had before the deluge. All that Pacific and Atlantic and Indian Ocean, they're new. They just moved in. They're squatters. In the Babylonian Enuma Elish, we read about it. It says, go and cut off Tiamat's life and let the winds convey her blood to the secret places. Flowery language, granted. Mythological language, granted. But there it is. Go and cut off Tiamat's life. Let the winds convey her blood to the secret places. Now, one of the greatest documents that helps to reveal the uh, whole history of the Nephilim is called the Book of Enoch. It should have been in the Bible, but <laughs> it didn't get there. And behold, a star fell from heaven, it says, and the children of the earth began to tremble and quake before them and to flee from them. And again I saw how they began to gore each other and to devour each other, and the earth began to cry aloud. Right? Just like Revelation says, a star fell from heaven. Now the Nephilim were not on Tiamat, as I said. They had descended to earth to hide. After the deluge, they emerged and set up their dummy base. Uh, uh, sorry, not their dummy base, but their actual base, known as Atlantis, on the vast continent of Appalachia. Appalachia is now beneath the waters, but it used to be England and Ireland, part of Scandinavia, the Arctic, Greenland and Iceland. You could walk the whole way. Про неї суворо оберігають і не піддають розголосу. Повторення всесвітнього потопу. Це станеться, якщо Нібіру пройде над одним із полюсів. Крига розтане, і спасіння тонучі – справа рук самих потопельників. Інформацію про Нібіру і досі замовчують. Жодної програми, жодного документального фільму. НАСА не публікує результатів своїх досліджень. Та зараз мовчати вже немає сенсу, і відомості про червону планету спливають на поверхню. А в травні 2012-го її побачать усі неозброєним оком. У вересні того ж року Нібіра буде схожа на друге сонце, тільки червоного кольору. Та найгірше чекає на нас у грудні 2012-го, коли Нібіру наблизиться до Землі на ризиковану дистанцію. Небесне тіло, превышающе розміри Землі в п'ять раз, пройдет по орбите в опасной близости от нашей планеты. Сила его притяжения будет настолько мощной, что Земля может поменять наклон. Если это случится, то изменившаяся ось вызовет смену магнитных полюсов. И тогда на планету обрушатся невиданные силы наводнения и извержения вулка, сметающие все на своем пути смерчи и землетрясения. Это Захария Сичин, знаменитый американский ученый. В 1978 году Сичин делает сенсационное заявление. В Солнечной системе вовсе не 9 планет, как считает официальная наука, а 10. По утверждению ученого, кроме всем известных планет, существует еще одна – Нибиру. Она блуждает в космосе по невероятно вытянутой орбите и проходит через Солнечную систему раз в 3600 лет. В теории Захария Сичина в научном сообществе отнеслись с недоверием. Астрономы не могли поверить в то, чего не видно в космическом пространстве даже в самые мощные телескопы. Однако уже в начале 80-х, после длительных математических вычислений и построения компьютерных моделей, существование планеты Нибиру было доказано. В 82-м году у нас допустило существование большой планеты, которой впоследствии было дано название Нибиру. В 2005 году американские астрофизики заявили, что на расстоянии приблизительно в один световой год от Земли располагается огромное космическое тело. Но главное, на огромной скорости оно приближается к нашей планете. Небесное тело настолько темное, что ни оптические телескопы, ни другие приборы не в состоянии его увидеть. Зафиксировать загадочный космический объект ученые смогли лишь два года назад, когда на земную орбиту вышел новый сверхмощный инфракрасный телескоп. То, что увидели астрономы на расшифрованных снимках, сделанных с телескопа, надолго повергло их в шок. В черной пустоте космического пространства четко угадывались очертания огромной планеты. Сомнений уже не оставалось. Это не Бирл. Инфракрасный спутник, который действительно засек объект достаточно больших размеров 
И э, ему удалось этот объект не только засечь, но и как-то зафиксировать, сфотографировать. После изучения параметров и траектории движения гигантской планеты, ученые пришли к неутешительному выводу. Не беру больше Земли в пять раз. Но самое страшное, через три года она может пролететь в нескольких сотнях километров от Земли. Находясь так близко к нашей планете, она запросто сможет сорвать с нее атмосферу. Ученые выяснили, что однажды Небиру уже погубила другую планету. Оказалось, что 16 миллионов лет назад в нашей Солнечной системе существовала планета Фаэтон. Она располагалась между Марсом и Юпитером. Теперь на ее месте пояс астероидов. Ученые считают этот пояс не что иное, как осколки древней планеты. По словам астрофизиков, скорее всего, Небиру столкнулась с Фаэтоном, когда она в очередной раз проходила через Солнечную систему. После такого удара планета разлетелась на куски. По словам ученых, правительство просто скрывает от человечества правду, чтобы не вызывать панику. Представители во всех военных разведок мира эту информацию о том, что Небиру может принести значительный ущерб, урон, разрушение и даже гибель жителей Земли имеют. А не разглашается эта информация и не становится достоянием общественности только лишь потому, что НАСА и все эти структуры хотят спасти достойных представителей Земли, спасти всех они. Four times larger than Jupiter, it dwarfs Jupiter and the Earth, as you see in this illustration. It has already been sighted by astronomers in the southern hemisphere, as you can see in this picture. Citing deviations in the movement of Pluto, NASA has been tracking it for over 50 years. Russia has been preparing by completing the construction of 5,000 underground shelters in Moscow in 2012. FEMA has prepared by purchasing millions of plastic containers for coffins. I know you've heard of them. You're probably familiar with this. And here's the images. What are they preparing for? The United States has embarked on a 24-hour, 7-day week effort to build massive underground shelters for over 30 years. These are reserved for government officials and high-ranking military personnel. Many people believe that the Denver Airport, as you see in this marker, says New World Airport is one of those places. Deviations of the movement of the sun proves the existence of an object of significant gravitational pull coming into our solar system. Here is the orbit. It will, it will enter into our solar system and pass between the Earth and the sun. <clears throat> blocking out the light of the sun for about three days. And the Bible says, And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth as hair, and the moon became as blood. 
The earthquake will be caused by the increased gravitational forces caused by the alignment of the sun, Nibiru, and the earth. <coughs> the darkness caused by Nibiru's extreme size and moon appearing red is caused by a partial blockage of light typically seen in lunar eclipses, as you see in this illustration with the, with the earth blocking out the light to the moon. And here you can see uh, the moon going through its lunar eclipse, uh, the block light turning it red. What's going to happen is the Earth is going to tilt on its axis very quickly, causing tremendous stress on the Earth's crust. This will cause a sudden movement in the Earth's axis, resulting in dramatic changes in the wind patterns, tremendous earthquakes, movements in the Earth's crust, and tsunamis on every coast. Millions, possibly billions, will die. And the heavens depart as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island is moved out of their places. Can you imagine it? And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and rich men, and the chief captains, and mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens in the rocks of the mountains. The dens in the rocks of the mountains sounds like shelters to me. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, who are these people? Well, they're government officials and high-ranking military personnel. Hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and the mountains? Sounds like shelters. And here you have it. Reserved for government officials and high-ranking military personnel. You may ask yourself, what can I do? How can I protect myself? Well, you have to call out to the one that's in control of all of this. The only one that can protect you during the troubled times ahead. And that is Jesus. I know that I've sinned. Please forgive me and come into my heart. He says, Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy rest, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Hi, Chris Potter here. How are you today? This video is in regards to why we can't see Planet X, Nibiru. Procobulus, Destroyer, Purifier, what the F you want to call this thing, mini solar system, why we can't see it. Now, go outside and just look what's in front of you. Friggin' houses, apartments. That's one of the reasons why you don't see it. Chemtrails, geoengineering. Oh no, that's not happening. But there's 144 patents. Go check out geoengineeringwatch.org. Yeah, you're being sprayed. End of story. But I'm not saying that uh, it's being done to hide in the Biru. Planet X, Heraculus, destroy a purifier, nemesis, whatever. Right? But it's kind of interesting that it does obstruct your view. Most planetary objects can only be seen through infrared because they are not in the visible light spectrum. Go get an infrared camera and you'll be able to see it. Now, okay, yeah, I actually saw it and there are other people that have taken pictures of the red-brown dwarf. When I saw it, when I say it, I mean the red-brown dwarf. I mean our buddy son, like the partner son. Because we got a binary solar system, okay? Two suns, okay? I think we got three, but two, okay? Going around each other. And our buddy son, like our brother son, yeah, he be coming back. And every time he be coming back, stuff happens. Like people be dying. Like most of the people be dying. Earthquakes, volcanoes, sinkholes, mass freaking animal deaths and tsunamis and, you know, Water turning red and bloody. Wormwood hitting the Atlantic seaboard. You know, just weird stuff like that. That happens every type of cyclic pattern and uh, cyclic pattern, whatever you want to call it, and tends to wipe out most of the people on the planet Earth. And we just start all over again. So there's this little thing that, yeah, you can't see it too well. Now, why did I see it? I don't, I can't really explain it to you. I was only able to see it for about 1.5 minutes. And it was 6.55 in the morning on 1.15.15. 15. 
The sun was on the very left. It had not even come up yet. The red-brown dwarf was in the horizon on the right. Because of smog is another reason you can't see this stuff. As well as its position currently in the outside of the solar system. Some people say it's like right here next to Jupiter. It's coming into the inner solar system, meaning that it's going to pass between us and the sun. Okay? So, it's pretty close. It meaning the sun, and it appears to have its own planets and moons. Yeah. So, rest assured from what I understand, most of the issue is simply that it is an infrared light spectrum issue or visible light spectrum issue. You need to have an infrared telescope. Even the clear obstruction of driving down the road and cars in front of you and buildings, right? Like even going up into the mountains, there's trees and other mountains that are in a way. This thing is not just like there and huge. It's gonna be. It's gonna be. Yeah. Nibiru's the planet. That's one of the planet. That thing's going to be so big, it's going to be 50 times the size of the moon. And it's going to rip the continental flipping crust from the bottom to the top of the planet in 30 minutes flat. And the U.S. military knows that. Yes, they do. Folks, they've known about this thing for a long time. So our little meager questions about why can't I see it? There's a lot of reasons you can't see it that are very, 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 very rudimentary and common sense in nature. Like you walk outside and stuff is in front of you and that's why you can't see it. Now, you can go ahead and do your own research as to what the physics and astrophysics behind that is because I'm not here to address that today. I'm only here to address some of the very basic, you know, skilled blue collar level, because that seems to be where most of us are, you know, <laughs> a little bit above stupid. And uh, as long as I communicate to you on that level, I think you'll kind of get it. Okay? <laughs> Have a great life. Bye-bye now. The, my screen came on, but the mute button was pressed. Okay, guys, listen to me. Um, I'm about to ready to burst into uncontrollable tears because of what happened. As soon as my phone came on, um, I'm going to play for y'all what was coming over my phone. I intercepted an alien communication. I'm we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, remember? What do we wrestle against? Principalities of darkness and, high. and wickedness in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. Guys, I'm on the river, and as you can 
see, we've got the welder's glasses on.